Welcome to another episode of Cannabis Tech Talks. My name is Andrew Ward. I am the managing editor at Cannabis and Tech Today. Today, I'm joined by legitimately one of my favorite people in the cannabis scene. I've known him since I got into it very early on around 2017, 2018. Uh, he is uh, a cannabis advocate, a business-minded advocate, a smart dude all around. Uh, he's worked for some big name companies in and out of cannabis. Well, out of cannabis, he's run his uh, brand and he's built up a huge brand as an events person and now in the education space with LIM College in New York City. I'm talking to Mike Zaitsev. He is the academic director of the school's business of cannabis. Yo, Mike, uh, how's it going? It's great, man. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for the kind words, Andrew. And you're also one of my favorite people in the cannabis world. So I want to get that on the record. I appreciate that. And that is, I appreciate you saying that because I'm a hermit who never comes to events. And I, but usually when I did, they were high and wide. <laughs> thank you thank you for that. so yeah so i said mike zeitz have to kick it off that is weird uh i would be happy to say your name but we all know you as mike z if anybody knows mike from the uh days of the cannabis advocacy world and coming up and you know you, you still hear mike z a lot from the back of the days but like the lim days lim days brought in you know the official name so it's good to use both here man um well deserved pro- by the way professor z now you know that's the yes new yes <laughs> yes. I see. All right. Cool. Professor Z, we'll, we'll drop that in here a couple of times. Uh, so, yeah, Mike, uh, you know, we've kind of you get asked this question a lot, but I think it's a really interesting one. You know, you guys were one of the first schools to really back the cannabis education program really, and, you know, offer, you know, actual certification behind it as well. We're starting to see a few more colleges take off and some growth in it. But uh, fill us in on how LIM College kicked it all off and how you got involved. Yeah, for sure. So I have to give all the credit to my colleagues and the school leadership and in particular uh, the the chair of our business department, Michael Ondrigan, who has been at the college for over a decade. And it was really his idea. He, he saw that one students were really interested in, in uh, you know, it started with, they did a panel on CBD and wellness, beauty and wellness, and a ton of students showed up. So then he was like, why don't we do a class on the business of cannabis and you know it filled out filled up in like minutes and then you know he basically pitched the board on creating a business of cannabis degree program and you know there was some initial skepticism like a a lot of people they they go what's a business of fashion college gonna do in cannabis and traditionally for the last 85 years lim has been all about the business of fashion and what Michael Londrigan understood and was able to convey was, you know, there's a ton of overlap in these industries from the supply chain management to the visual merchandising to the importance of retail and marketing to the whole lifestyle element of it. You know, he realized kind of the same stuff that I've been saying for years and that I know you've been saying for years and it's in my book, it's in your book, you know, figure out your transferable skills and bring them to the industry. And he understood that a lot of the stuff that LIM College teaches students for the business of fashion is directly applicable to cannabis. And so that's kind of how things came to be. And then as far as me joining the team and getting involved and running the programs, you know, I I like to joke that it was my destiny, but, you know, so somehow I ended up there and I'll share the reason that I say it was kind of my destiny is it actually... The college itself and my office where I work is like literally around the block from the first high and why event that I attended oh, wow. like many, 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 many years ago when I first got into the whole scene. So I, I joke that it was meant to be. Oh man, that's awesome. And I've, you know, I've heard also in past interviews, you're uh, more of a, a meant to be in the cannabis world was you immigrated to the U S on four twenty ninety one. Was that right? That's right. When I was a baby, my folks came over on 420. So that's my my favorite holiday for many, many reasons. Hell yeah, man. And also just bring it back to, uh, you know, Mike was, he shouted out real quick, you know, he is one of the first books that I actually read in the cannabis space and actually used as a roadmap for mine as well. Um, you've done, what is it, two or three cannabis books now? Is that right? I've done two. And I actually, I have it here just for the, the little shameless plug, you know, the cannabis oh, yeah, plug business away. book. And I'm actually very close to getting the third edition uh, 
published. So I'm doing, as you know, this industry changes so quickly and a lot of stuff that, you know, last time I updated it, a lot of things have changed, most notably, you know, this move to reschedule and, you know, a lot of other stuff. So I'm, I'm doing my best to get the thing updated and keep it fresh. And hopefully it'll be available in the next few weeks on Amazon, the updated edition. Nice, man. Nice. We will drop a link when uh, it's ready and we'll be sure to shout it out. Check it out uh, when that drops, folks, for sure. Um, Yeah, man. I remember when I was writing my book, um, you know, I I put it out as cannabis jobs and there's data points and stuff. And it's, you know, I was actually used in the program at Stockton University in New Jersey for their cannabis program. And at at some point I told them, I was like, you know, you can use the book, but like, you know, give the students a heads up the data points and everything has changed. Like there was market optimism at first in there. And then we went through the like the hiring downfall for a little i was like i don't want to like make them feel like this is irrelevant like tell them right now you know it's going to be a little bit of a tough haul to get there but uh it feels like we're actually turning a corner now you know we were we were talking about that a little bit before we came on here you know um it's a long hard road in cannabis it still is a long like a long way to go from launching but how do you feel about the current market you know it feels like we're kind of it seems like we're seeing a little bit more optimism even though there's still a lot of hardships in the game yeah so you know, first of all, shout out to Rob Mejia and Stockton. Great, great yeah. program. Great people. Love the work they're doing. And um, yeah, as far as your question, I think, you know, here in New York, I'll, I'll start with kind of locally and then maybe talk globally here in New York. Um, I think we have to be optimistic because it's hard to imagine that it could get any worse. You know, it oh. seems like it has to be, you know, only uphill from here. And, you know, I think it's a really interesting point we're at, you know, I'm hearing that as early as next week, we're going to, uh, we're going to hear who the new interim director of OCM is. Um, so, you know, certainly it's, it's at a turning point at the very least. Um, and you know, more stores are getting open. They've stepped up enforcement of illicit shops. So I think, slowly but surely things are moving in the right direction and and as i as i said to someone yesterday at the cwcb expo you know in the long term i'm more optimistic than ever before in the short term eh, we'll see it is what it is it's going to be tricky but you know i th- i think things are turning around and and globally or nationally it, it's hard not to be optimistic with you know although rescheduling represents a huge uncertainty you know it's hard to imagine that long term the industry is going to be smaller than it is now you know I, I can't imagine how that could be and I think we're only still in the very early stages of a global industry so you know 20 30 40 years from now it's gonna it's gonna reach that potential that we all talk about um so you know I think the volatility is going to be there for a while, but things are moving in the right direction from from what I see. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like right now weed is a good like look into like a joint pack with like some good brown paper. It's you know it's a slow burn. It's going to take a good long while. Uh, unfortunately, unlike a good long burn from a joint, this has got to tick up and some bad stuff along the way. So yeah. maybe if I pack that joint, I guess maybe it would be kind of a good analogy. And it's going to burn. Um, it's going to burn for sure. It's going to be some burning. <laughs> absolutely yeah and hopefully you know the good people won't get burnt along the way um but you know a uh, shout out to lim you know stockton and all the other schools that are you know starting to you know educate the, the you know the people that want to get into it especially a lot of young folks but also some other folks that are going back to school and learning and getting involved in you know the programs and stuff you know you've uh you've been in this uh the thick of the education game for a couple of years now you know from your perspective what do you like what do you uh what's the assessment i should say of you know the ongoing state of education and cannabis in schools across the country and you know what do you think are some standout points that schools need to have to have successful programs yeah it's a great question um i think you know i I could speak to our program because obviously i know that one pretty well um it's been really interesting i could tell you a couple of things one is that you know much like the early days of high and why and you know the early new york scene and and most of the cannabis industry in general, the people who are there really want to be there. You know, they're not, they're not the can of curious. They're not the, you know, oh, 
maybe let me check this out. No, like the students are extremely passionate and they're like, some of my students were like, I came to college. I wasn't going to go to college, but I came just because I could study cannabis, you know? So I think I, I like to say that it's, it's been a gateway to higher education for some of my students. And similarly, you know, that's, that's really for the undergraduate program. Um, for the master's degree program, which is fully online, um, those people, it's been a mix of career switchers, you know, people from healthcare, people from the mainstream compliance, uh, and people from all across the board, from retail to marketing, and, you know, even, even some attorneys who are just like, hey, I've worked for 5, 10, 20, 30 years, and I want to be in cannabis because they have a passion for it. On, on the flip side, we also see some students who are already working in the industry, whether they're, you know, on the dispensary side of things or trying to start their own business and more entrepreneurial. And they just see this as an opportunity to advance their careers. And the same way that, you know, they were like, should I get an MBA or do I go get a master's in the business of cannabis? And, you know, I think one of the biggest value adds of the the degree programs, aside from obviously learning from industry experts and, and getting access to, you know, this material that until recently you couldn't really get anywhere. Um, you know, I think the big thing is you show a potential employer or a potential partner, or potential investor that you're really serious and dedicated, right? That you're willing to spend the time and the money to go get a formal degree. And, you know, I imagine once the industry starts, you know, all that job growth that's projected for the next decade, it's going to be really competitive. And, you know, I, I have to believe that having that degree or being one of the few people in the world with one of these degrees is going to put you at the top of the list when applying for these jobs. So, you know, let's, I hope I answered your question. I'm not sure oh, if yeah. I did, but. <laughs> no, you did, man. I actually think that that's a really uh, interesting point too, because, you know, when I first got in this, I'm sure you did too, you know, you know, and for decades before that, you know, the, the mantra really was like, if you want to be in it, show up and, you know, like really show yourself and be in there. And like, yeah, still, that is still very much so important, but like, it also, like you're saying, like, it feels like having that education is becoming a bit more like other industry validated, like showing that is kind of like you're showing up, you put in the work you actually did the education so it's like it kind of seems like the evolution of the cannabis job market to a bit or at least the education side absolutely and i think as the industry matures employers will want people that have a formal education you know it's not going to be enough to say hey you know i've been doing this informally for many years like i mean and not to knock those people i have the utmost respect for everyone that comes from the legacy market and taken the risks and have gotten their hands dirty or, or whatever in, in the weeds, let's say, um, you <laughs> yes, know, sir. there's, there's, there's no substitute for real life experience. And, you know, that's a big part of why in our programs, we require several internships along the way. And, uh, you know, so students graduate with hands-on work experience in the industry. Um, but, you know, as the industry matures, it's going to look more like other industries and they're going to want people with formal training. And, you know, we're still in the very early days of any kind of formal cannabis workforce development. But, you know, I think a decade from now, it's going to look very, very different and much more like any other mainstream industry. What's green and grows like a weed? It's not cannabis. It's the money green rebates can save you through utility rebates and incentives. Did you know you can recover up to 100% of your investment in light fixtures or HVAC systems through your local utility? It might sound too good to be true. It's not. Green Rebates has helped hundreds of growers around the country secure more than $43 million in rebates and incentives. New buildouts, retrofits, or equipment upgrades, they are here to help. Visit www.greenrebates.com to learn if your facility is eligible. Also, feel free to drop Green Rebates an email to talk through your specific facility needs. They would love to help you put some money back in your pocket. Again, that's 
www.greenrebates.com. Definitely no shade to the people who get their hands dirty on it. I think we, we both don't have any intent on that. I think like the real one that could be the concern, like I pre- these have been fading out over the years anyway, but I feel like the people that just send you the DMs and like, hey, I want to work in weed and stuff like that. It's like, all right, I'm sorry. You're probably going to get cut out by like these other two pathways. So like those, those ones, unfortunately, might be getting phased out in the next few years. Um, but, you know, Mike, you're saying like, yeah, and I agree with you. I think like we're heading towards, you know, the industry becoming normalized in terms of a lot of ways. And, you know, there's definitely pros and cons to that, but in the job side market, you know, there is a lot of formality coming into it, which is, you know, good in a lot of ways. Um, you know, what are, what are some of the jobs that you're seeing most in demand in the marketplace right now? And how does that align with, you know, the education interests of the current students at LAM and, you know, just at the college level? Yeah. So I think that's a, like, like a lot of things in this industry, it's complicated, right? A seemingly <laughs> simple question, but there's no simple answer. And because, when you say the marketplace, right? Um, it's really like, which one? You know, in, in New York or New Jersey, you know, where things are fairly early in the adult use marketplace, there's certain jobs that are in demand. Whereas if you look at, you know, California or one of these more mature markets, the the types of needs are very different. So, you know, I, I've had the pleasure of speaking with a lot of cannabis employers you know, as soon as I got the job at the college, they started calling me on day one, asking me for interns, which was pretty funny because we hadn't launched the program yet. And so <laughs> I, I was going around saying, I got more employers than I got students right now. You know, who wants an internship? <laughs> but um, but I, I think the needs vary, but, you know, it's a little bit of everything. So in New York right now, there's a lot of, you know, as these dispensaries open, I, I see a lot of you know, kind of entry level retail roles to store manager to inventory specialist, um, you know, marketing and branding is always in demand. Uh, legal and accounting is always in demand. But, you know, those are it's kind of plenty of cannabis lawyers. Shout out all the cannabis lawyers. Um, <laughs> um, Just you know, few. whereas whereas when I talk to some of the bigger employers, some of the MSOs, you know, what they're really looking for is leadership and management you know, people that can manage teams and run operations and have a track record of scaling businesses, you know, that's really the need there. So uh, I think it's different across the board, but, you know, as, as I'm sure you're well aware, given that you wrote the book on cannabis jobs, you know, it's like two years ago, I would have given you a very different answer probably. And two years from now, it could be a different answer depending on how, the you know the market evolves and with schedule three you know maybe pharmacist will be like the hottest job in cannabis in a couple of years i i don't know you know yeah it it feels like the job market is almost a bit like the stock market in a lot of sense where you just got to keep your eye on it and you know at the bottom could drop out or surge up at like really in really quick succession yeah it's definitely still a startup industry so you know I, i i used to have the the stat so i'm gonna I won't give you an exact number, but it was something like as far as job mobility and people changing jobs, I, I forget what the what the exact metric was, but it was, you know, something like people in the cannabis industry change jobs, you know, I think like two or three times more frequently than people in mature traditional industries. And look, it's because there's, you know, Part of it is that green rush element. A lot of companies come and go. The regulations are constantly changing. You know, the funding, you know, global pandemic happens or or whatever that, you know, all this other stuff in the economy takes a turn and, you know, it impacts the industry. So, yeah, um, we're, we're it, one giant time. startup industry. A hundred percent. So, so, you know, yeah, even be, the most established nimble. companies are are still just starting out essentially. Absolutely. And then on the flip side, you see like, which is a shame and a travesty, you see like high times, right? Like one of the most well-known, longest standing brands in cannabis, you know, but from a business standpoint, can't get it together in recent years and who knows what will happen next with it. So, you know, no, no lead is safe to, to use the sports analogy since we were talking sports a little bit before the indeed, podcast. Indeed, indeed. 
Indeed, indeed. And just to clarify, I am uh, I, I love my folks at High Times, but yes, uh, as many media outlets, they have taken a, a bit of the brunt in the last few years. And you know, yeah, that and that's a really interesting point too, because like there are cannabis exclusive industry setbacks, and you know, we see a ton of those. But then also, like for example, you know, like a major cannabis publication like that, you know, you see that the digital media model is just falling apart too. So it's like you know, it, I feel like there's a lot of elements and multiple layers to really kind of like suss through and you know like you were saying before we came on the air you know it's it really is a long game and you know this is not a get rich quick scheme and if you want to be in it you gotta you gotta take a lot of licks unfortunately and uh, you know if you survive great and that's kind of the, i feel like the motto is here how about you what do you think like the is that like a fair market sentiment at this point a thousand percent you know i think you gotta i i always encourage everyone to think long term if you're gonna get into this and you know, you got to have the love of the game, <laughs> you know, and and on a more practical matter, I think the advice that I give my students and anyone else who will listen, the students, they have to listen. So it's great to have that captive audience. But, um, you know, the advice that I always give is, you know, just build your skills and contribute your skills. And if you're adding value, then there will be opportunity for you. And if you're gaining experience and learning, then you can always pivot and take that experience with you. Um, that's kind of the the two biggest pieces of advice are, you know, continuously grow and and develop your skill set and also nurture your network because you know the people who who last and survive and you know, like you've been in this for a long time. The the cannabis media world, the cannabis journalism world is is no walk in the park it's no picnic and you know i i'm i'm very lucky that i know several of the top cannabis journalists like yourself and you know it's not a big group this like you know the elite few who have persevered over the years so you know keeping in touch with all those people maintaining good relationships and having them know you as a person of integrity who can get a job done who can be reliable and is that productive and adds value i think that's a huge piece of the puzzle yeah man absolutely i think that's so huge like i definitely want to talk about nurturing the network but like i feel like you know you really that consistency you know i as much as it sucks to say it there is little room for error in this game i feel like if you if you develop a bad track record or if you're just not consistent with your work you know that hurts in any industry but especially in a space that's so big on cat like in like startup mode and you know very thin margins to work with like you unfortunately got to hit it out of the park every time or there's someone else on deck that could easily come in. That's for sure. And to me, it goes back to the thinking long term, because I've seen many times, unfortunately, where people are, you know, thinking about the near term or short term and trying to capitalize or take advantage and, you know, either burn a bridge or, or do something less than, you know, compassionate, moral, ethical. And, you know, in some ways, it's a very small community. It's a tight community. And, you know, you all it takes is one one time to, you know, mess up your reputation. So I think it, it's critically important that, again, you have that long view and that patience and, and, you know, as simple and cliche as it is, just do the right thing, do right by people. And, you know, to, it doesn't have to be much more complicated than that, right? Yeah, man, you know, and I, that is one thing for all the knocks that I you can say about the legal or I just in any with the weed space in general, like there is a good, you know, standing of like filtering out the crap. I feel like other industries, you know, a lot of bad actors filter through. And I mean, obviously, there are still some in cannabis, too, but like people don't forget. They seem to hold a good long memory of it. And if you do wrong by someone, especially someone who's got an established record of doing right, there does seem to at least be a good sector of the community that will keep that in mind going forward for like business and job opportunities or whatever opportunities to come about yeah i think the people who have endured and taken the sacrifices to to be in this industry especially from the earlier days right you know like they don't want to see the you know they don't want to see the bad actors they don't want to jeopardize the whole thing because you know uh not to not to give an example but i'll give an example of like med men right which was like a media darling and a wall street darling but did a lot of 
terrible things, bad things, exploitative things, and clearly didn't have great character in, in some of the leadership based on some of the stuff that I heard that they were doing to employees and the way they were talking about people and all this stuff. Um, you know, that reflects on the entire industry and the people who have put their livelihood and freedom on the line and taken all the risk to help legitimize this. They don't want to see people like that celebrated. And, you know, one way or another, if you're in the industry, you're a representative of the broader community. So I, I think people have to really be mindful of that, that there is still a big stigma and this is still a federally illegal industry in many ways. So even though it's more and more mainstream every day, we, we still have a responsibility as as people in the industry to represent and hold, hold ourselves to a high standard and hold the community to a high standard. Yeah, man, I totally agree. I think that's a perfect, uh, you know, summation of that. And, you know, uh, not even an individual, but I think the one that my favorite blowback I saw in recent years was when uh, that product Cannabumps hit the market. And like, for anyone who doesn't know, it's basically distillate weed that was sold in powder form to look like Coke vials. And like the amount of immediate industry blowback from like all walks of life, it was just like, holy shit. All right. We do have a filter here. We have a threshold for problems. It, it, uh, I love that example. It makes me wonder, like, I, I just imagine, you know, the conference room where they agreed to make that happen. And I'm like, I'm willing to bet there was not a woman in the room to be like, listen, bros, this is not a good <laughs> idea. That's just my guess. I don't know. <laughs> I, every every person in that boardroom, I don't know their makeup, but they definitely were doing coke and probably drinking bang, bang <laughs> So yeah, <laughs> no, um, yeah, dude, I think that that is a great example of it. Like your your consistency and your your reputation is definitely huge in this market. I kind of want to bring it home on this. We could keep going on, obviously, but I want to bring it home on the other side. You're talking about is building your network. So you know, you obviously being high NY founder created one of the first really great networking cannabis communities in New York City. Um, you had a hand in a lot of that great growth out there. Um, and you're obviously attending a lot of events now. I know you're not as in the event space on the day-to-day -day as you used to be, but, you know, still get to see a couple of events here and there. And you were just recently at CWCBE, you know, what is the level of importance of those events in terms of building your network? Like, is it still the primary way to do it? Do you still have to show up or are there other ancillary ways that you recommend people do it? Like what kind of, you know, what's the state of the live game and how do you, how does that all fit into building and maintaining the network? Yeah. Wow. So I think, look, I think there's, you, you said it earlier about showing up is, is critically important. I think there's no substitute for that. I'm, I'm a little old fashioned in that regard. Like, you know, you gotta, and, and I, I find that especially in the cannabis industry, it, there's like a very, I don't know. I, I feel like it's unique to the industry and in that in other industries, it's less important. Like, you know, when I was in the tech industry, decade plus ago we were already doing video calls and video conferencing and that was like very normal and it was fine you know and i think especially post covid everyone got much more comfortable with that but i feel like cannabis people love to get together they love to be in person they love to to chit chat and just hang you know i think that's a big part of it um so i think it's critically important especially because the industry is still relatively fragmented, right? So even when I go to these conferences, which, you know, started out for me, like back in the day, it was like, this is the only way I could get an education, right? Yeah. was to go and, you know, pound the flesh, so to speak, and to meet the people and be like, hey, I got questions, you know, like I'm going right to the source, like, tell me, how's this work? How, you know? And so yeah. I, I still think that that's a huge an important aspect to it because you got to make those connections and there's no better way to do it than face to face, maybe over a joint. I don't know. Depends. Um, so I, I think it's critically important. I think things have changed though. You know, I, I, I talked to a lot of people at the expo yesterday and was, was asking them out of curiosity and maybe, maybe market research and, and competitive <laughs> intelligence, who knows, of, you know, like, what kind of events have you been going to? What what have you been seeing lately? What's interesting? What's exciting? And, you know, it was a lot of the folks that I would consider, you know, the staple, the old guard, the usual suspect. And, you know, they were giving me all sorts of different answers. And several of them were like, 
oh, I haven't been doing as much of that because I've been too busy with work. So I think that's, you know, a, an interesting, yeah, right. <laughs> Same. And so I think that's an interesting kind of trend, at least in New York. Um, but then a couple other people have told me that, you know, they've been going to smaller events that were more, you know, focused and specific as opposed to like the big events where it's kind of like, you know, huge expos or conferences or festivals or whatever. Um, so, you know, I, I think it will continue to evolve. And I expect that once, at least in New York, once the once the legal industry advances a little more, I think, you know, there's going to be even more integration of nightlife, hospitality and cannabis. Um, but again, I'm I'm also very confident that if you wanted to go to a different cannabis event in New York City every day, you easily could. So it's definitely out there. It's just, you know, I, I feel like it's become right now we're in a phase that's more like social and party and entertainment as opposed to maybe education and networking. And I think, you know, that'll, it'll go in waves. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think once the industry takes off a little more, there's going to be a return to, you know, oh, now there's a thousand brands. We need to network. We need, you know, the industry's <laughs> right. gotten so big that people are going to have to do job fairs and all this other stuff. Um, so, you know, it's a, a very long winded way of answering your question. So forgive me, but I think there's no substitute to showing up and connecting in person. No, nah, man, I, I appreciate the the in-depth explanation. It basically, I think, summarizes it all for like a lot of job seekers is get the education, show up, and then eventually, hopefully, find a way to get enough work that you're so busy that you can actually attend events. But then you <laughs> hopefully try to break that part of the cycle and keep attending events. So here's hoping if you could break that. Of the, break that. <laughs> they, they don't make it easy for us, right? <laughs> no, not especially not in New York, man. We got to work to make our money and we got to, uh, you know, survive up in here. So it's tough. But but, you know, I um, I totally agree. I do think going to events is really huge. I've been long running trying to go to them more. And I think, you know, remembering the awesome events from the early days like Kai and Y is definitely, you know, the stuff that always stays fresh in my mind, as well as a lot of really great stuff that's going on nowadays. And like you said, the specialization of it and some of them even being on the smaller side and just making them more, you know, pointed. You know, uh, you know we're seeing a lot of quality in a lot of events. And um, yeah, it's really about riding the ebb and flow because because everything we're talking about could change in six weeks to a couple of years. So, you know, that's the nature of the cannabis game. And, uh, you know, Mike Zaitsev, better known to my buddy as Mike Z, I appreciate you for elaborating on everything here. One thing before we turn it, before we wrap this up, turn it over to you. Is there anything that we haven't touched on that people uh, should know about? Uh, how do they get in touch with LIM? How do they get in touch with you? What, uh, how do they uh, follow along? Uh, you could reach me. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you could reach me. Uh, on Instagram at Hi Mike Z, or if you want to connect professionally, I highly recommend LinkedIn instead. That's an addendum to the last question is, you know, LinkedIn is cannabis friendly. The industry is on LinkedIn. So uh, you could find me there. Um, what else? For LIM, you know, limcollege.edu. Uh, you can learn all about the cannabis programs and apply to the upcoming semester for either undergrad or graduate, um, both of which are available fully online and the undergrad is available on campus as well. And what else? Yeah, look out for the book is coming soon. Yeah. Um, you know, and hope to see you at an event in person. And, you know, just the, uh, I, I think that's all I got. I, I have questions oh. for, I, I gotta get you, I'm, I wanna interview you. You know, I oh yeah, like yeah. You, I, I, I you, always get so much insight and knowledge from speaking with you, and you know, at the very least, that I, I want to get you into guest lecture next semester. So, because so many of my students are interested in the media side of things, so I know you've got a 
a wealth of knowledge to offer there. Oh man. Well, I saw that a couple of years ago, I think it was Lil B who was a guest lecturer at Harvard. And I think I could do just about as good as that. So <laughs> I'm excited. Uh, no, dude. Yeah. I also, I should acknowledge Mike wanted to ask me a question during the show and I completely steamrolled that. So I do apologize. And I owe you a spot on, uh, on an interview anytime, dude. Uh, but Mike, I really appreciate you. Mike Z, Professor Z, Mike Zaitsev, the academic director of the business of cannabis at LIM college. Thanks so much, buddy. I'm sure we'll be talking again soon, but thanks so much for taking the time. Thank you so much. My pleasure, Andrew.